Let the Bible Speak, with your speaker, Brett Hickey. We're continuing in our series on the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. We're on the fifth Beatitude in Matthew 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We're learning that there is a link between holiness and happiness, not the hollow hilarity of those living for themselves, but a special blessedness that God has for us. Blessedness, of course, is a spiritual state that brings one peace and contentment because he knows that he is living life at its best, just the way God prescribes. We noticed before that what makes the Sermon on the Mount so special is not that the entire message is brand new, but that Jesus is able to bring all these great truths together with such impressive packaging and organization. His order of presentation with the Beatitudes is intentional. This is most obvious by the first and last Beatitudes. When Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, he was signaling the importance of recognizing one's personal inadequacy apart from Christ. Without this type of humility, the other Beatitudes cannot be lived out. And then the last beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, is obviously the most challenging in the list. It's also noteworthy that the first four beatitudes deal primarily with our relationship with God. The poor in spirit, mourning over sin, meek, hungering, and thirsting after righteousness. While the final four beatitudes are more concerned with our relationships with our fellow man being merciful, pure, peacemakers, and persecuted. The word mercy is often confused and even perverted. Murder is sometimes called merciful. The killing of the elderly or euthanasia, as it's sometimes called, is often referred to as mercy killing. This is not what Jesus had in mind when he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. As a naive 25-year-old, I remember going with my wife to her doctor about halfway through her pregnancy with our first child. On this particular appointment, the doctor asked if we would like to have an amniocentesis performed. A what? We may have heard the word before, but we certainly had no idea what it meant. During this procedure, the doctor inserts a long needle through the abdominal wall and into the sac of amniotic fluid around the baby and then withdraws about two tablespoons of amniotic fluid. We asked the doctor about the purpose of amniocentesis, which by the way has a 1 in 200 to 1 in 400 chance of causing a miscarriage according to WebMD. The doctor explained that it was a test to determine whether an unborn child had one of any number of birth defects, including Down syndrome and spina bifida. I found that interesting and yet perplexing. I asked, well, doctor, if we decide to have this test and we find that our child had one of these defects, how would that help us? Well, he said matter-of-factly, at least in part, you may decide to terminate the pregnancy. We were repulsed and refused the test. Five to 10% of expectant mothers, though, have had amniocentesis, and some of them abort their unborn child. Tragically, the test is not 100% accurate. One in every 100 children that are aborted but, uh, because they believe they have a birth defect take the life of a child who does not have the birth defect as believed. Why do parents abort these babies? They do so supposedly out of mercy. After all, the diminished quality of life for such individuals, they suggest, makes it merciful to end their life within the womb. This does not qualify for the blessedness that Jesus was talking about either. I shudder when I think about a doctor offering me this test and this option on my son, Joey. I think about Danielle at our congregation, a bright ray of sunshine who has spina bifida, ending her life 
would not have been merciful. It would have been robbery. We would have been robbed of the joy and love that she gives us. Man may see it as mercy, but God sees it as murder. We will see what Jesus did mean after our song. When Jesus comes Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. One of the strongest statements Jesus made involved driving home the priority of mercy in Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of men and anise and cumin, but have neglected the weightier manners of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. We all want to be able to say with confidence what David wrote in Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Jesus tells us in this beatitude that the key to receiving mercy is to show mercy. But what did Jesus mean by mercy? Does it describe me? Does it describe you? Bynes Expository Dictionary says that mercy is the outward manifestation of pity. It assumes need on the part of him who receives it and resources adequate to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. The Modern Dictionary defines mercy, kind or compassionate treatment of an offender, adversary, prisoner, etc., in one's power. Mercy is similar to but not identical to clemency and leniency. These are important distinctions. Clemency is a colder word applied to the moderation in the exercise of the legal power to punish. Leniency is an easygoing forbearance that may involve inappropriate laxity or indulgency. This is a popular form of tolerance, a let it slide attitude toward everything. Speak, people speak of this as mercy, they have missed the mark. There's no blessedness here. The Christians at Corinth may have used this misnomer for their handling of the man living in incest. Instead of confronting him with the evil of his behavior, they tolerated it. They acted as if everything was okay. Paul brought this error to their attention in 1 Corinthians 5, and by the time he wrote them the second time, they had confronted him and he had corrected himself. Some today 
take the same lenient approach to sin under the guise of mercy. When the preacher dives in after those drowning in sin, others urge him to have mercy on them. What they really mean is for him to be lenient, tolerant, and accepting of the wrong and the one doing the wrong. In fact, to sit back and watch someone drowning in sin and act like there's no problem is actually unmerciful. How important is it that we demonstrate mercy? Obviously, Jesus says that those who show mercy will receive mercy. The flip side is true also. If you do not show mercy, don't expect it either. A more colorful demonstration of these uh, truths are taught in Matthew 25, beginning with verse 34. Listen to what Jesus says. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked or, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, that is, showed mercy, to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angel. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Instead of a blessing, it's a curse for those who are unmerciful. Jesus teaches here that he will separate the sheep from the goats based in part on whether or not we are merciful or not. This gets my attention. This same point of view is taught in Jesus' interview of the rich young ruler. He told the young man in Luke 18, 22, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we see no other wrong responsible for the rich man being in torments other than his failure to show mercy to Lazarus. Both rich men we're in a position not just to have compassion, but to show compassion. Both had adequate resources to help others, but stingily refused. The apostle writes in 1 John 3, 17, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? The Old Testament stressed mercy as well. Zechariah 7, verse 9, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, every one to his brother. Proverbs 19, 17, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. What's your attitude toward the legitimately poor and needy? Generosity toward the poor, the Bible teaches, is the greatest investment of, all, investment of all in the bank of heaven. This brings us to the heart of what separates the merciful from the unmerciful. It's selfishness. A lack of mercy is more common among those who are consumed with their own business than it is of sheer meanness. We can become so self-absorbed that we never stop to consider the plight of those around us and our ability to help ease their suffering. It's not merely that we should avoid mistreating others. We must reach out to help. The Bible says in James 1 verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself spotted from the world talking about mercy. The Holy Spirit addresses the root issue in Philippians 2 verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. 
You know why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea? No fish can live in it. Only a few plants exist around it. You know why? It has an inlet, but no outlet. A briny body of water becomes stagnant. And so we stagnate spiritually when we are always taking, always taking and never giving. Jesus, of course, did more than issue a command to be merciful. He illustrated it with some of his greatest parables. Whenever we think of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, we should thank mercy. The question asked Jesus that generated this parable was from a lawyer testing him. The lawyer asked in verse 25, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus then tells of a man who was robbed, beaten, and left for dead. When two highly respected Jews, a priest and a Levite, see the man, they pass by on the other side. They were not abusive. They did not demonstrate, uh, but they rather they demonstrated a lack of mercy through their unwillingness to get involved. Jesus then introduces us to a Samaritan man who would have been despised by his Jewish audience. In verse 33, Jesus says, And when he, the Samaritan, saw him, he had compassion. In other words, the Samaritan's heart was touched by the beaten man's condition. This did not qualify as mercy, but it moved the Samaritan to action, which did constitute mercy. The Samaritan doctored the victim's wounds, transported him to an inn on his own animal, and paid for a room to recover in. The story concludes with Jesus asking a question to answer the lawyer's question. Which of the three men, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was neighbor to the victim? And the lawyer answered, He who showed mercy on him, Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Mercy begins when we open our eyes to those hurting around us. All three men in this parable saw the victim, but there was a disconnect between the eyes and the hearts of the religious men. When the Samaritan saw his condition, his heart was touched immediately. The first two men were locked up in their own little worlds. They ministered daily at the house of God, but were indifferent to the plight of a desperate fellow man. Jesus said that their reaction was incompatible with love. To be merciful, we must be able to break free from our own little worlds, our own problems, our own pain, plans, and dreams. C.S. Lewis wrote, To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. The merciful do not divide people up into those who can promote our agenda and those who cannot. When we see a need and we can meet it, we act. That's mercy. Mercy manifests itself in forgiveness of personal offenses. Joseph's attitude towards his brothers is a perfect example. No one was more profoundly abused and mistreated as Joseph was. His brothers were jealous of the favoritism extended to Joseph by their father Jacob. Jacob gave Joseph a coat of many colors as a token of his special love for him. Joseph didn't exactly endear his brothers when he told of a dream that suggested that they would one day bow down to him. When Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers miles from home. They had the opportunity they were looking for. There was even talk of killing Joseph, but Reuben intervened and they threw him in a pit instead. 
Later they decided to sell him into slavery. They dipped his unique coat in goat's blood and led Jacob to believe Joseph had been devoured by wild animals. Years later, Joseph managed to have risen to a great position of power in Egypt. His ability to interpret dreams prepared Egypt for a great drought. While neighboring countries were decimated, including his brother and father, Joseph's counsel to store up grain during times of plenty enriched Egypt. Ultimately, Jacob's brothers had to travel to Egypt to ask help of the Pharaoh. Imagine Joseph's surprise when, in Genesis 42, 6, his dream is fulfilled and his brothers bow down before him as they arrive in search of food. Joseph held them in the palm of his hand, but instead of punishing them for their abuse, he extends mercy to them. One of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament is his statement to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 19 through 21. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly, to them. Mercy. In Lee, the last years, Charles Flood reports after the Civil War that Robert E. Lee visited a Kentucky lady who took him to the remains of an old tree in front of her house. She bitterly cried that its limbs had been destroyed by federal artillery fire. She looked to Lee for a word condemning the North, or at least sympathizing with her loss. After a brief silence, Lee said, cut it down and forget it. Bitterness militates against mercy. We must, like Joseph, move beyond our personal hurts if we're to receive mercy ourselves. In my investigation of this topic, I've been intrigued by the biblical association of mercy and truth. Psalm 85:10, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. These scriptures make it clear that mercy and truth are not incompatible, but complementary. Any explanation of mercy that downplays truth cannot be harmonized with God's word. The mercy that Jesus preaches on in the Beatitudes is not a blind tolerance of every kind of belief and behavior, but compassion in action that parallels a love and obedience for divine truth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Stay with us after our song for a final word and how you can get a copy of this message. Amen.
Again, our beatitude this morning was found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Jesus extends mercy to you, but you must also comply with his teaching. He that believes and is baptized, Mark 16, 16, shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We're glad you joined us this morning. We hope you will watch the program every Lord's Day. And then join us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. Call or write for a DVD copy of 825, Blessed Are the Merciful. We close with the words the Apostle Paul issued in Romans 16, 16. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless. Yeah.